Our report identifies eight loopholes preventing accurate disclosure in financial statements and SEC disclosures. They don't talk about those asbestos-like health harms in any disclosures that we've looked at. If they're giving different numbers to their insurers, uh, investors should have a right to know that. The SEC allows companies to exclude any shareholder resolutions that would ask a company to talk about the financial risks of any environmental issue, uh, any human rights issue. The regulators have been ambivalent about whether and how to require companies to disclose these issues. Sanford Lewis, you are counsel of the Investor Environmental Health Network, and you've just written a report called Bridging the Credibility Gap. Eight corporate liability accounting loopholes that regulators must close. Now, this is about contingent liabilities. First off, tell us what contingent liabilities are in everyday language. Companies treat public health and environmental costs as externalities. They don't bear the cost, and the society does, unless the liability system intervenes. From the perspective of our report, the most important liabilities that companies face are those that reflect externalities that are being internalized. Uh, contingent means potential. That's right. What is particular to shareholders? They want to know what the range of potential liabilities will be so that they can estimate the true stock value and not be uh, subject to distortions of a company underestimating its liabilities. Uh, Sanford, the, the core of the report is the eight loopholes themselves and uh, recommendations for each of them. Uh, let's look at them in turn. First, short-sightedness. Under current accounting rules, companies typically tell investors about the liabilities that they expect over the next year. If they're really generous, they might say uh, what the liabilities might be over the next four years, say. but. Um, but for the most part, the current regulatory framework emphasizes the short term. It really doesn't capture a lot of the main issues that companies are going to face over the long term that many investors care about. The arc of the liabilities, if you will, might take 10 or 20 years to actually play out from uh, the course of injury happening um, to uh, the first lawsuits being filed till the full economic impact is felt on the company. Companies know enough to disclose that this is a possible risk earlier on, uh, but they do not. This is pointing towards the second loophole, which is concealed science. You know, for decades, asbestos companies knew about the hazards of their products, but they concealed them from workers and from investors. The workers paid with their health. Eventually, the companies from the liabilities became bankrupt and just, uh, you know, all value to the investors was lost. Now, asbestos started out as like a miracle product, and so the companies that were investing in it, um, that were uh, committed to it, they were very excited to promote its fire retardant properties, and they played down the other hazards. Sanford, what are the parallels between asbestos and nanotechnology in terms of the risks that they present to health and the financial community? Um, nanotechnology are these very innovative materials. They operate at the molecular level. They're building uh, the building blocks of these materials. The, their unique size also create unique toxicity possibilities, uh, harm to human health, harm to the environment. Um, a really good example is carbon nanotubes. Um, these are very strong uh, materials. They have some really exciting properties, but they've also been shown in the laboratory to cause the kind of condition that's a precursor to mesothelioma. No disclosure report says this could be the next asbestos. Moreover, they don't talk about those asbestos-like health harms in any disclosures that we've looked at before the SEC. What we're saying is the SEC should say that it's a baseline requirement that when these studies come out, 
uh, the company's got to talk about them when they reach a, a level of credibility that they have right now in this instance. Another loophole you identify is the known minimum or lowballing estimates. Even though companies may have projections about their likely liabilities and the range of liabilities, uh, the current rule doesn't require them to put that on the books. All it does is require them to accrue the known minimum, a, 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 which could be a very small fraction of what they'll ultimately have to pay. Investors really need to know more. They want to know uh, what's the worst that could happen with this company on these liabilities. How serious is the bankruptcy risk, for example? Uh, Johns Manville estimated that they had 350 million, that's what they were accruing for their liabilities, but when they declared bankruptcy, they said their liabilities were $2 billion. You can see it's an enormous jump from the known minimum to what they actually ultimately have to pay. Uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, who set this, uh, this rule, the known minimum, uh, is considering right now changing it so that a company would have to report the range and I, I think it, that they really have to move on this this year and change it so that uh, the company at least has to report the range of possible liabilities. The fourth loophole in the report is privileging secrecy. What do you mean by privileging secrecy? One thing that we concluded in the report is that the existing disclosures rely much too heavily on lawyers. Of course lawyers need to protect their confidential attorney-client communications. There's, there's no question about that. Uh, the problem is, should we then rely on those lawyers that are sworn to secrecy uh, to uh, give us whatever disclosures are going to appear in th these uh, financial statements and disclosure reports? Well, no, we shouldn't. Um, we should look at whether there are other ways of getting some information that's not privileged, that won't increase companies' liability, but that will give a fairer number. We recommend in the report that uh, increasing reliance be placed on third-party consultants who could develop estimates of liability without relying on privileged information. The fifth loophole is inconsistent estimates, or estimates that are different in one place for example, to insurers as compared to another place, uh, to investors. We've discovered that companies are disclosing different amounts of liability to investors and to their insurers. Uh, to their insurers uh, for whom they want to pay claims, they may develop an estimate that goes over the course of 50 years and represents billions of dollars, while at the same time they may develop an estimate for investors that is of a much shorter timeline and is, you know, tens of millions of dollars. I believe at a minimum, uh, if they're giving different numbers to their insurers, uh, investors should have a right to know that. Number six, hidden assumptions. Bill, let me give you the example of Johns Manville. Um, the lawyers and the consultants got together and the lawyer said to the consultants, we want you to use the lowest estimate assumption whenever possible. So when it came to estimating how many people would be sick, go to the lowest number. When it comes to estimating how many claims might be filed, go to the lowest number. When it comes to these kind of scientific assumptions in particular, the regulations are weak and vague and, and, and don't really uh, talk about the need to put those assumptions on the table in the disclosure reports. And, and you point out how this has a cascading effect or what you call a, a feedback loop where uh, one assumption leads to a series of assumptions that, that further push the estimate down. Yeah, well, what, what, what happens is once a company heads out on this track of trying to uh, minimize uh, their uh, liability estimate, uh, there really are you know, so many different notches that they can cover. By the time you get through uh, with a set of assumptions, you basically have developed a fictitious scenario that, uh, that you know, there's no way it's going to happen, and, and, and the, the, the real estimate is, is somewhere in the higher range. And, and it would have been more accurate had the assumption started at a more realistic level to begin with. Well, it would, but at, at least if you're going to use very uh, restrictive assumptions, they really have to be disclosed. 
Number seven, missing benchmarks. And the benchmarking is based on uh, real experience at other companies. That's right. Now, you can't use benchmarking in every instance. Some companies face novel kinds of litigation, but in many instances, there is an experience of claims that's already happened at other companies, and it is possible, therefore, to do some benchmarking. When Dow Chemical bought Union Carbide, um, they um, did not mention uh, and did not calculate the amount of asbestos liabilities that they would face. Uh, but a couple years later, uh, they went and they finally benchmarked uh, the company's asbestos liabilities against others and found that um, they, they could estimate that they had $2.2 billion of liabilities that they had just purchased um, in the course of buying Union Carbide. Um, so they, they should have done it, you know, they should have done it when they bought them. It should be just like, you know, this is a standard accounting practice. You have to benchmark your liabilities. The final loophole is risk-free proxies. Almost sounds like a good thing. On the annual proxy statement, that company's issue, right now the SEC allows companies to exclude any shareholder resolutions that would ask a company to talk about the financial risks of any environmental issue, uh, any human rights issue, any kinds of issues uh, or liabilities that they might face in the future. You know, this, is, this just does not make any sense from the standpoint of shareholders. That's what shareholders care about and want to know. They want to know what those risks are, and if they're not already in the financial statement, why not be able to ask through a shareholder resolution and have shareholders vote on the issue? You know, they did it post Enron, post uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, that they established a uh, a rule that actually cut back on the rights and ability of shareholders to ask for the kinds of information that they need. We're in a situation right now of a crisis of confidence that we're trying to get investors to trust the market. And you make recommendations that could help plug up some of the holes and put us back on a firmer financial foundation. I can't think of an issue that is where, where the problem is, is clearer and where the credibility of the financial statement is so much at stake. The truth is there's much more that can be done to ensure honest accounting without increasing the firm's liabilities. The regulators just haven't gotten around to it yet, and I think now is the time. Okay. Sanford, it's been great talking with you today about your new report for the Investor Environmental Health Network. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure to be here.